Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie McGrath, editor of Forbes Women. Today, Senate Republicans blocked legislation that would have protected IVF access in the United States. Here to explain exactly what happened is Congresswoman Sydney Kamlager Dove. She represents the 37th District of California. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start by asking, there are essentially two bills that the Senate was considering, one from the Democrats, one from the Republicans, both which would have protected IVF. What's the difference between these two bills? Well, um, <laughs> unfortunately, the one that's from the Democrats is not moving, um, which is also a bill that doesn't contain any poison pills, uh, unlike the um, Republican version, uh, which is also, I think, um, very vague uh, because Dem Republicans like to say that they support access to IVF, but then the language that they use um, really will not allow that kind of protection to be codified. And they are still holding on to definitions that say um, life uh, begins right at the moment of conception, which becomes very challenging for women who are trying to access either reproductive rights, abortion rights, or um, fertility treatment. Uh, I'm not surprised that um, about what happened today on the Senate side. Uh, you know, Republicans probably were listening to, you know, the Southern Baptists, which just came out and said that they condemn IVF. Uh, and they are continuing to listen, I think, to their presumptive Republican candidate, who has also been very wishy-washy um, on IVF and was the architect behind um, the Dobbs decision. Democrats in the House have a bill uh, that would codify um, protection of IVF and other fertility treatments. And so our hope is that um, this bill can be taken up. I think currently there are 174 co-sponsors, including actually four Republicans. So it is bipartisan. And so it would be great if the speaker um, would exert some constitution and listen to 84 percent of Americans and allow this bill to be voted on. You referenced the broad popularity for IVF protection, and I therefore wanted to ask you, why did this bill fail if, technically speaking, both Republicans and Democrats agree that we should be protecting IVF? Is it all on the margins, and is there room for compromise here? I think there's always room for compromise. I mean, the American people every single day, you know, in their living rooms, uh, at their kitchen tables, uh, in the boardrooms are figuring out ways to compromise. So I don't understand why Republicans are not willing to come to the table with Democrats and find some common ground. As I mentioned, the majority of Americans support access to abortion care and also access to um, fertility treatment care. I think in the quiet rooms, Republicans recognize that this has truly become a bread and butter issue. It is about freedom and the ability to make a choice. And Families across ideological spectrums have all had to consider or try to access fertility treatments, including IVF. I do believe um, that there is a fringe, extreme portion of the Republican Party, the MAGA rights, which have and are continuing to hold this issue hostage. You know, evangelicals uh, worked with President Trump to become sort of the architect of the Dobbs decision and the unraveling of Roe v. Wade. They are, the, the door was left open with the Dobbs decision to consider contraception, and they are hungry, they are ravenous to continue to find more ways to deny women these rights. And I just believe that you know too many Republicans are unwilling to stand up um, to this draconian narrative that is being forced on women and say fertility treatment at the very least, uh, just like contra contraception, should be made available to all women. Now, you say that the fringe right is ravenous to claw back women's rights, reproductive rights, and the IVF issue really burst onto the scene. I, you've heard advocates kind of warning that this would happen ever since Dobbs was overturned. But we saw what happened in Alabama earlier this year. The Supreme Court of Alabama came out with that ruling that would have 
curtailed IVF access. The state did eventually protect IVF access. So I'm wondering, Congresswoman, how under threat is fertility treatment in the U.S. if a state like Alabama can even come forward and say, we're going to protect this? Well, remember, um, the Supreme Court and Justice Thomas did say with the Dobbs decision, this is just the beginning, and we are very interested in looking at contraception. I'm thankful that today's ruling on, uh, or the recent ruling with Mifepristone uh, was upheld. But to your point, um, what happened in Alabama, I think, um, is a roadmap for a number of red states in particular um, uh, to follow. And so, you know, we know as for IVF, some cl clinics in Alabama temporarily restarted IVF services in the wake of the Alabama law, uh, but we also know that that won't be permanent. And so I think just recently a hospital in Mobile, Alabama has already announced that they are going to halt IVF services um, until the end of 2024 due to legal risks. So what we are seeing is that fertility treatment uh, clinics and providers are thinking about liability and legal risks before they're actually taking into account the needs of their patients and what their patients want because of A, the Alabama ruling, and B, what came down from the Supreme Court. And patients are confused. We hear that all the time about, you know, how people are wondering, should I go to this state or should I cross state lines? So let's talk about your legislation. How likely do you think it will be to pass and become law before the election? I know reproductive rights have become such a hot topic when it comes to the 2024 election. Can we hope to see legislation signed into law before November? Well, I am an eternal optimist. Uh, I'm also a co-sponsor of the bill, uh, the Access to Family Building Act, which would protect um, IVF and other fertility treatment services and also bring some clarity to what happens with eggs and what happens to sperm and what happens when you're trying to, you know, have them and then maybe harvest them and freeze them and keep them because that's where a lot of the legal nuance um, is happening. I am an optimist, but I really question whether or not this speaker, you know, has the constitution and the spine to bring this up. So my hope is that uh, Democrats will win the House in 2024 and take the majority back, and then we are able to bring it up. But until then, we are going to continue to talk about it, and we are going to continue to both encourage um, and shame Republicans into joining onto this bill and asking the speaker to bring it up. Because remember, there are Republicans that are saying, I support IVF, and yet they refuse to sign on to this bill and they refuse to have it come up for a vote. So that is, to me, an example of folks speaking with forked tongues. And so I'm always about showing the receipts. So if you care about IVF and if you care about women, then co-sponsor this piece of legislation and work to bring it up on the floor. I asked earlier about compromise. Are there any items in your bill that you'd be willing to take out in order to get more Republicans to the table? No, because it is a bare bones bill um, that really just focuses on the basics. We don't have any poison pills in there. It's not talking about abortion. And in my mind, those would be third rail issues for many Republicans uh, that would prevent it from coming to the floor. So we are strictly talking about IVF and access to fertility treatments. Remember, Donald Trump supposedly said he supports IVF. Remember, Speaker Johnson supposedly said he supports access to IVF and other fertility treatments. And that's all the bill says. So if that's what you purport to care for, then this bill is the compromise because it's only talking about those issues. They, you say they purport to care, but we also, you referenced the Southern Baptist Convention and their vote on IVF. And I know you participated in a press conference today talking about the importance of IVF. Was that timing coincidental or was that meant to be in response to the Southern Baptist vote? A little bit of both. I think it is important that we continue to talk about this issue and also show the hypocrisy, expose the hypocrisy of this Republican Party the extremists within the Republican Party, and what the American people want. I think it is so strange that um, the Southern Baptists uh, voted to condemn IVF while they also talked about 
folks in their membership, part of their congregation who used IVF to help them conceive. So, I mean, I don't know what the biblical term is for hypocrite, but it seems that seems to be a really great example of what that means and what it looks like. Congresswoman, there's been a lot of debate today. Any final words on the matter of IVF access in America in 2024? You know, France uh, recently actually passed a constitutional amendment protecting a woman's right to have abortion. Uh, there are a number of countries that are also standing up and saying IVF, fertility treatment, abortion access is incredibly important. I wish the United States would continue to lead in this space rather than falling far behind because there are so many families who are putting the hope of having a family, expanding a family on hold who are pausing that dream because of these kinds of rulings. And we have to push back on that. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you.